Good afternoon, and thank you very much for attending this webinar on information exchanges and competition law. Uh, my name is Paolo Palmigiano, and I'm, I'm a partner in the competition practice here at Taylor Wessing. Uh, but I've been in house for 20 years of my career, and I have to deal with lots of information exchanges for my internal clients. And it's an area of law which I really enjoy. So I thought I would share some of my thoughts, some of the practical steps I used to take and I still take in order to assess information exchanges. And I thought to do information exchanges because we've all been bombarded by webinars on COVID-19. And I really wanted to do something different, something that applies all the time. And also, because as I said, it's an area that's been a great interest to my internal clients. Of course, I could not mention COVID-19. So as you see from the content, I do touch it very, very shortly because I want to focus on the other sections of my presentation. It's certainly long, as you see. We'll start with information, I'll start with information exchanges, I'll cover price signaling, trade associations, benchmarking exercises, information exchanges in a vertical context, mergers and acquisitions, joint venture between competitors, and finally, COVID-19 uh, cooperation. This is a lot to cover in one hour, so it cannot be uh, comprehensive as I wish, but I hope to give you an idea of the issues to spot, and especially some practical tips on how to address the issues in each of those sections. And of course, I'm happy to assist you with more specific queries. The recording and the slides will be available on my page on the Telewesting website if you want to go back and look at them. Uh, during the presentation, I will use a few cases to make some of the points I want to make. Of course, again, I have to be selective because I won't be able to cover every case in this area. So let me start with the first section, the main one, obviously, information exchanges between competitors. I know that some of you are competition lawyers who are very familiar with the rules, but I know that also some who are in the audience who are not competition lawyers. So I thought I would just use one minute to give very roughly an idea of what is competition law. I mean, competition law is the area of the law which, was purpose, which, purpose, which has the purpose to protect market competition and free trade. It prohibits certain practices that restrict competition between companies. One of the key principles of competition law is that companies must determine independently the policy that they intend to adopt on the market and the conditions which they intend to offer to their customers. It is, of course, true that companies can adapt the conduct to what the competitors does, they do, but without any direct or indirect contact with them that might restrict competition. But also, competition law is there to protect the interests of consumer, to make sure that consumer gets the best product at the best price. Uh, this presentation will talk mostly about UK and EU, because as you know, the rules are very similar so far. And clearly, you have the two competition authorities on both sides of the channel, which are competent to apply competition law. It is the CMA here in the UK and Digicomp in Brussels. Competition law covers a wide range of areas, but for the purpose of the presentation, clearly the key one is what we call anti-competitive agreements between competitors. And that is the ones I'm sure you know, cartels, price fixing, market sharing, customer location, and information exchanges. It is part of this area of law. And in order to understand what I'm gonna say later, I have to do my only hopefully legalistic point of the presentation. When we talk about Article 101, which is the one prohibiting cartels and price fixing, we talk about restriction by object and by effect. The restriction by object are restrictions which are so serious that the authority has only to prove that the conduct has happened. They don't need to prove anything else. By effect, on the other hand, the authority has to prove that the conduct has an effect on competition. You will see quite soon why this distinction is quite important to the assessment you do 
of the information exchanges. Competition law also deals with abuse of dominant position, which I will not cover here, and magic control, which I will only cover for the purpose of exchanging information. So let's start with information exchanges in general. Many commentators agree, and even the authorities themselves say that information exchanges can be beneficial in a market. For consumer, having at their disposal more information certainly helps them to make better choice. You can only think of a comparison website, which allow all of us to choose the cheapest price available. But also for competitors, certain exchanges are very useful because, for example, if I know how my competitor, what process my competitor has, I can improve my internal processes and certainly help promote, and therefore can promote, for example, innovation. I can promote best practice. But also there are discussions that can lead to standardization if you have that discussion between competitors. Always a good thing. But the exchange of competitive centric information, and we're talking especially about price, but also other elements, which I'll discuss later. If it happens between competitors, it can raise competition issues. And one point I'd like to be stressed here is what we're talking here is what we call pure information exchanges. But the infringement, the breach of competition law, is only the exchange of information itself. For example, if there is a cartel, in a cartel there will be a lot of information exchanges. The capitalists want to know if everybody's competing equally, if everybody's adhering to the prices, they exchange prices, quantity, et cetera, et cetera. If that information exchange is part of a cartel, we will assess as part of that cartel. But also you can have information exchanges in a legitimate corporation, R&D, joint production. Again, it will be assessed as part of that legitimate corporation. So as I said, we're talking here about pure information exchanges, information that leads to a breach of competition law. And there are different ways in which that exchange can happen. It can happen directly in a meeting room. It can happen directly through a third party, a trade association. It can happen in private. It can happen in public. We'll discuss all of that in the course of the presentation. And if you're interested in information exchanges, I have to suggest you read the horizontal guidelines because the latest version, which was out in 2010, has an entire section on information exchanges. I have to say that there's certainly the guidelines are certainly helpful, but there's a lot of uh, lack of clarity in a lot of different points, and I'll mention one specifically later on. I, 15 years ago, I created an association of in-house competition lawyers, and I chaired it until recently. And it has now 450 in-house competition lawyers. And a few years ago, we carried out a survey. And we actually did it again a couple of weeks ago, and we got a very similar, a similar response to a specific request we asked. And we asked, what, what are the area of competition law that you consider the greatest risk for your organization. Obviously, we expected cartels, abuse of dominance, cultural restraint, merger issues. But as you can see, the one that got the highest number is certainly exchange of confidential information. So I think it's an area in-house we have to deal a lot of the time. So we, we, uh, you might be aware that currently the Commission is reviewing the horizontal uh, uh, block exemptions. So actually, the association, we prepared a long section, section on information exchanges, and we are, as I said, at the first stage of engaging with the Commission on that, as, may, as are many other parties. And if I may do a little bit of PR, uh, membership of the association is free to announce lawyers, so if you're interested, just let me know. Uh, now we start, now let me give you some guidance about what we do, what to do when to assess the information exchanges. I have taken this uh, graphic graph from a, a, a document that the OFT, the predecessor to the CMA, had in one paper they issued on information exchanges. And I really like it because it shows the two extremes and the middle ground. Let, let, let me start first with the two extremes. On one side, as you can see to your right, 
you have information which is public, historic, and these are less likely to have an anti-competitive impact. Most of the time, it's not a problem. So we, 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 we know what's not a problem. On the other side, we, you have an, a, a, what is clearly a problem, and usually we're talking about future strategy, future pricing. These are exchange of, uh, exchanges that are fined as if they were a cartel. Uh, again, we're talking about a couple of cases which are clearly identifiable. The problem is in the middle, because the middle is the one where it requires an assessment, as I said earlier on in my presentation, by effect. And it requires a lot of different things to consider. And it is therefore the most difficult part of any assessment for, for, for a competition lawyer. But let me therefore clarify about the two extremes I mentioned. The first, as I said, to the left, the object box. And you can see immediately, and I've used it, uh, uh, an OFD case from 2006 and the Ozone Garden, what it is that is a problem. It is communication concerning non-public future prices. Is our object case. Similarly, the exchange of individualized data regarding intended future price or quantity is considered a restriction competition by object. By object. So again, this is the black box where clearly we should never go there. On the other side, you have what is called the not a problem box. And uh, it is the exchanges of generally public information, which is unlikely, as the guidelines say, to constitute an infringement. Now, we all think we know what is public information. We, we, we have a concept of what it is. But I think the commission here uh, has created a slightly different concept of what is public or not. Because if you see carefully, it talks about genuine public information. And they define it as information which is equally accessible to all competitors and customers in terms of cost of access. In other words, according to the guidelines, obtaining it should be no more costly for customers and companies and affiliated exchange system uh, for companies exchanging information. So it's not exactly the same thing as what we think is public information. And I want to give you an example which simplifies the, the, the difference. It's a case involving a, 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 a petrol station on the French motorway. If you travel on the French motorway, you'll see a, a, a petrol station approaching and you will have the prices of petrol at that station. But in France, you also see the prices of the three following stations. So you can choose and decide where you want to stop to fill your tank. What happened in France was that the, the petrol stations started calling each other to see what price they were putting on the, on the motorway. And you would assume that that is public information. I mean, it's on the motorway. You drive by and you see it. That's not what the competition authorities say. Competition say, the authority, French competition authorities say, actually, no, that is not genuine public information because no customer in their same mind would drive all around France and start collecting the data or the prices on motorways, which is what you do actually by telephoning each other. The case was quashed on appeal for different reasons uh, than just the exchange. It was just because there, it had no effect. But you can see where an authority might deem public something which is different to what we might deem public. Let me deal now with the difficult part, which was the effects analysis. And if you are not in the two boxes at the extreme, but you are in the middle, I think you have to start looking at two things. The first is the characteristic of the market. So, for example, is the market concentrated? That means that there are very few players on the market. Or are they high, uh, high barriers to entry? So companies have difficulties in entering. If that's the case, clearly the information exchange can affect the behavior and can have an anti competitive effect more likely than in other markets. You also look at the products which are available in the, which are available on the market and, and the companies which have exchanged information. Because if the companies are very similar in terms of what they do, in terms of their market share, product ranges, then obviously 
it, the information exchanges change is likely to have more effect. I mean, we was completely different companies dealing with completely different items which have different cost structures. The more similar they are, the more the effect you would see on the market. So. The other elements of the analysis that you look at is, of course, the type of information exchange that has been exchanged. So you look, first of all, what is the type of information that has been exchanged is it genuinely public? Really available everywhere? Uh, we're talking about trends, something which is in newspapers or in annual reports. And the horizontal guidelines uh, say what it is that actually they would consider a problem if it was shared. So they define competitively sensitive information as prices, discounts, forecast, production cost, profit margins, customer list, future company plans, such as strategy and marketing plans, sales volumes, investment, R&D program, et cetera. So it gives you an idea of what it is, the type of information that there should be concerned. Secondly, you look at what is the market coverage. I mean, the more companies exchange the information, the more likely is that the uh, information exchange will have an effect on competition. You also look at how old is the data. If you remember, if it is all data, clearly it's not. It has no importance for, 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 for if it is exchanged. So as the guidelines say, data that is generally historic is less likely to restrict competition. The issue here is we don't, do not have a clear threshold when, when data is old. It will depend on the sector. It will depend on the type of information. So you can have a market in which Five years ago, the information is still relevant. You could have another market very rapidly evolving where information which is six weeks old is already old. So it all depends on the market where the information is being exchanged. Also, you look at whether the data is individualized or aggregated. If it is aggregated, you're less likely to see which companies has said what. So clearly, it will have less impact on competition. The more individualized it is, the more effect on competition. And finally, how frequent is the information exchange? Because obviously, the more frequent that information is, the more likely it is to have an effect on competition. So having given a, 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 a quick overview of the type of analysis that is necessary to distinguish between, let's say, uh, the not-problem box, uh, restriction by effect, and restriction by object. I've looked at some of the main cases and, and, through, uh, and put on the following slides a couple of principles which are important and of which we should all be aware. The first links with what I said before. Form does not matter. The exchange of information can happen in a, a huge variety of different ways. You can have uh, it can be done privately in a meeting. It could be done publicly by a published material, public announcement. We'll talk about price signaling later through a common th th third party, such as trade association, benchmarks, directly or indirectly. It could be bilateral or unilateral. You can do it by instant messaging in a joint venture, etc. In a way, any way in which it is done, uh, it doesn't matter. But also, importantly, it's not necessary to have an agreement. We always talk about information exchanges as an agreement between competitors. But in competition law, we have the concept of concerted practice as well. A concerted practice is a looser form of coordination that does not require the establishment of a binding agreement. In other words, it's a form of coordination between undertakings with which without having reached the stage that an agreement property so-called has been concluded, concluded, knowingly substitutes practical cooperation between them for the risk of, risk of competition. The most obvious example is unilateral price signaling. You don't have an agreement, yet it, it could be deemed a concerted practice. So, during the presentation, we've also talked many times about price, price being one of the elements which is essentially important and should not be exchanged. But 
we should also know that it's not just prices that should not be exchanged, but it's also pricing-related information. And I thought I would have uh, two cases here, one by, uh, both by Digicom, which went on appeal. In one case, you had banana importers of green bananas, which as soon as the bananas were coming into Europe, they were setting quotation prices, but they were starting to this, uh, but before doing so, they started discussing price setting factors, that is factors that were relevant to the setting of the quotation prices for the following week. They were also discussing price trends or getting information of quotation price for the following weeks. So they were not discussing the price. The price was done much later. And, uh, and, and, and the importer themselves say, but this is just gossip. You know, we're even discussing the way. It doesn't really matter. These things are not important. They're not price information. And the commission disagrees and say, no, this are, is an element which is useful for the setting of the price. So certainly it is uh, considered an illegal exchange of information. And another one, which is quite recent last year, HSBC, you all familiar about all the cases, LIBOR and all the others during the financial crisis. And this is one dealing with the euro interest rates where traders by uh, internet message and chat rooms were exchanging their trading position and sometimes also their pricing strategies. Again, the commission said this has an impact on the prices or on what it was, the, 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 the final uh, interest rate, therefore it is an infringement of competition law. Another other elements is are on this uh, on this slide. The first of all clearly is the fact that a single meeting is enough. That uh, came about came in a, uh, was, was stated by the ECJ in uh, T-Mobile in 2009. And it did, it, and it did really cause a, a, a lot of concerns at the time because always we, we always thought, like in a cartel, there's a series of meetings, and the same for the information exchanges. You have a series of exchanges that will lead to a breach of competition law. That was not what the court said. Let me let me remind you a bit about the facts of the case. Uh, five mobile operators in the Netherlands were meeting to discuss the response to a legislative proposal. And during coffee break, one of them discussed the reduction of dealer remuneration for prepaid mobile phone subscriptions. As you said, we're coming under pressure from our, from our resellers. Wouldn't it be great if we could cut the commission at 20%? So as the court said, confidential information came up in discussions between the participants at the meeting. Uh, one of the five mobile operators applied for leniency to the Dutch authority, referenced to DCJ about this case. And, and, and in, in the case, the authority kept on saying, but it was only one meeting. It, it, it was only one meeting. We didn't, and by the way, as I'll touch later, we didn't implement it. We didn't do anything with it. And the court was very strict because it said an exchange of future pricing information need to occur only once for the infringement to arise. It's clearly a high threshold. But it went even further because, as I said, it was one of the company who said it, and therefore the others didn't do anything. But the court also clarified that passively hearing is sufficient for infringement. So the mere fact that a company attended a meeting where a rival discloses its pricing plans is enough to find an infringement competition law, even though there was an explicit agreement to raise the price. So clearly quite a, quite a, a serious threshold. And that's why lots of companies are really, really concerned about meetings in trade association or meeting with competitors. I mean, I, 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 in my career, I've had to attend a lot of fantastic dinners with my CEOs when they were meeting uh, CEOs of other companies just to make sure that by mistake, they were not saying something they should not say. And, and, and also, another thing which obviously comes clear from the previous one, if passive hearing is sufficient, therefore, you don't need a bilateral exchange. We talk about information exchanges, but actually, you don't need an exchange. One-way communication is enough. 
And you find that in, uh, in uh, a similar statement by the Commission in Brussels and by the OFD here in the UK. The British sugar is quite an old case, but I think it's the best uh, uh, that, uh, for, for this uh, scenario. In, in, uh, in British sugar, there was a meeting that took place between representatives of British sugar and competitor Tate and Lyle, you know, sugar producers, at which British Sugar announced the end of the price war on the UK industrial and retail sugar markets. Then there were another 18 meetings concerning the price of industrial sugar, at which the representative of two leading sugar merchants were also present. At those meetings, British Sugar, only British Sugar, just gave information to all the participants concerning its future pricing. And the court said, the fact that only one of the participants reveals its intention is not sufficient to exclude the possibility of an agreement. And we have a similar scenario in the more recent case, which is RBS Barclays. RBS and Barclays have two teams dealing with mortgages to lawyers. And they were, both teams were invited by a consultant to a game of golf. On RBS, near the RBS team, you had, there was somebody who had just changed job and had just joined that team, so it was not yet familiar with the, with the sector. And while they were playing, he started chatting with the, uh, similar, with the other representative of parties, and they decided to meet. And if you read the decision, you will see all the meetings they had in all, in all by one, in pubs, et cetera, et cetera. And the guy from RBS started providing information to Barclays about pricing, future bids they were planning to do, RBS were planning to do. Barclays didn't give anything in return. And you know, at the beginning they thought he was bluffing. But after a while they did realize that actually that guy was saying, actually sharing with them their plans. And Barclays thought, therefore took advantage of it in this pricing decision. In, during one training session by the competition lawyer Barclays, this came up, and uh, at that point, uh, the Barclays went for leniency, got leniency, and RBS was fine. Again, here's a scenario where one side, RBS, was only providing information to the other, nothing was given return, and a legal agreement was found. Let me deal now with the final issue, possibly one of the most complex here. As I said many, many times, people say, yes, we, we were at the meeting, yes, we heard it, but we never implemented what, we, what was said. We never agreed to, to reduce the price by 20%. We never did it. We didn't act on the information. And again, the court has been very, very strict, basically saying, if a company receives unsolicited price information for a competitor, whichever the way, it is presumed that the undertaking has accepted and acted on that information in breach of competition law, unless there was a clear statement that the information is not wanted or rejected. And I'll deal with that shortly. So in other words, the court said, if the companies remain active on the market, they are presumed to take account of the information exchange with competitors. That second point is a reductible presumption, but how can you prove a negative? In reality, you have to prove that you're staying in the market and that the information you receive did not change your competitive behavior. It's, uh, it, it, it is impossible. And the other key takeaway I want to give you is that the reason why you have the information exchanges most of the time does not matter. And I want to cite Balmoral, which has been decided, which was a case by the FT, which went to court and was decided uh, two years ago. So I think it's an interesting one. Uh, uh, it's in the galvanized steel tanks uh, sector. Balmoral was a new entrant in this sector, and they slashed the prices by 20%. There were two other players on the market, which had actually capitalized the market. So clearly, when Balmoral entered and slashed prices, they were not very happy. So they invited the managing director of Balmoral 
to a meeting. Obviously, the purpose was to invite him to join the cartel. The managing director was very firm during the meeting. I'm not interested, I'm not planning to uh, be part of the cartel. And things could have finished there, but unfortunately they didn't because he remained at the meeting for another hour. And during that time, discussion of complacency matters came about. Most likely he didn't want to upset them too much. He wanted to still remain in a good relationship as he said in court. But the problem was that unknown to all three, the meeting was secretly being recorded by the OFT because they'd been informed by the, one of the suppliers about the issues. And only what happened was the two cartelists were fined for cartel activities. And the managing director for Balmoro, who didn't want to be part of the cartel, found itself and the company in breach of competition law for exchanging illegal, inf inf competitive sensitive information. And also, I know in ours, you always hear, and we see them in, in lots of decisions, all sorts of justification that business people give. I did not know that this type of behavior was illegal. My boss told me to do it this way. I was just following order. The one I always like, our competitors, all our competitors are doing the same. Our, I've known him for ages. It was just a, a gentleman agreement over, over a coffee. We've been doing this for years. I did not contribute to the discussion. I just listened. All of that, as I said, is not a reasonable justification to get, uh, to get, to give, you, to give the company an out of jail card. So what are the possible defenses that companies can implement? Uh, you might be aware, as I said, there's Article 101, one which says what the infringement of competition law is. But there's 1013 that says basically an infringement or there will not be infringement if those following criteria are met. Let me start by saying that if it's an object infringement, it's extremely unlikely. I've never seen a case where any of this justification will be accepted. So in a way, they will not be helpful if, you, if the companies exchange future price information. And also, they're very difficult sometimes to uh, uh, determine this criteria. I've had to do the exercise a couple of years, a couple of times in my career, and trust me, it's a very, very complex uh, exercise. But certainly, there could be efficiency gains in the, in the exercise because, for example, it could lead to cost savings. It could lead to uh, allow us to see what other competitors are doing we can do better. And also, it's very common, for example, in the financial and insurance sector to share information about credit worthiness of customer, which allows to determine the risk of giving a credit to, uh, to customers. And the Commission itself in the horizontal guideline gives an example in which, in their view, Article 1013 would be fulfilled. And they discuss an agreement between five producers of fresh bottled juice to establish an independent market research that on a daily basis collects current information about unsold juice at each point of sale, its supermarket, its, its shop. That information is then published on the web the following week in a aggregated form for each point of sale. What is important to understand here is that demand is unstable and the juice deteriorates in just one day. So what the information exchange through a third party does is it allows producers and retailers to forecast demand better and that avoids wasting a lot of juice. So before the, that information exchanges, exchange happened, there was a lot of wastage and retailers are reduced the quantity of juice they were purchasing because they didn't want to be left with a lot of juice that was expiring. So you can see why in that scenario you do have a justification about exchanging information. But clearly, as you can see, there are safeguards because you have an independent third party and it's aggregated. The other criteria are there, you know, the, 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 uh, the, it, it must be indispensable. So that exchange, that must be indispensable to achieve uh, the efficiencies, there must be a fair share to consumer, and the competition must not be eliminated. All criteria that are in the exchange of information of the fruit juice producers. 
But the one which is possibly the most important is, which is what the court said earlier on when uh, I was discussing uh, the previous slides, is you have to public distance yourself from what was discussed. How do you do that? I mean, the advice we always give uh, in house is if one of our business people receives an email containing sent to competitive sense information, then immediately an email has to go back saying, we have received the following email, we haven't read it, we have not acted on the information, we intend not to act on it, please refrain from sending it ever again. So in a way, you distance immediately yourself from the information, because remember, even a unilateral exchange could be caught by competition law. And that example is actually quite important in a case that the ECJ had to deal uh, recently, which is the Eteras case. Uh, this was a reference by the Lithuanian Competition Authority to the ECJ. And in that scenario, you had a, a travel platform, a book, travel booking platform, which was sending, me, sent a message to its members uh, informing them that discounts for online booking should be capped at 3%. And the platform itself unilaterally implemented technical measures that made it more difficult for member, member agents to offer discounts higher than 3%. They could still do it, but it was quite complex to override the system. So the competition was investigated, and you can imagine immediately what members said is, we have not participated, we just got an email. And the ECJ clarified exactly what it is that a competition authority should have done, should do in that in that scenario, and what companies can do to distance themselves. Basically, the Court of Justice say that the Lithuanian authority was entitled to presume a travel agent's participation if the agent was aware of the content of the message from the administrator. So you open it, clearly you have become aware of it. So what next? So even if you are aware, so even if you've opened or read that, uh, that email, a company can defend itself by proving they are distanced themselves. Again, by sending an email back saying, we will not do it. Or even actually systemically offering more than 3% discounts in a way overriding what technical measures have been implemented by the administrators. I think the case is also important for the burden of proof in general, the competition only had to have, but I think for the purpose of this discussion, I just wanted to stress the uh, uh, how to distance oneself from uh, an, uh, an exchange of information. The next section that I want to deal with, as I say, this was the, the, the first was the most important one and the longest. I, I, I'll go much faster on the others. But the one I wanted to cover immediately after is price signaling. Uh, price signaling is basically a company's public and unilateral announcement of potentially strategic information such as prices or output. Now, public announcements usually are not a violation of competition law. Every company, you know, has a certain obligation towards a shareholder. How many times a shareholder's meeting, a CEO says, we expect to do this or we plan to do that, that that's what we're planning to do. They have also, the companies have all obligation to report their market share, their, 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 their turnover. So there's a lot of information which is put in the public domain unilaterally. Customers must be informed of price increases, promotion. You see adverts in the press, you see mailings. We all receive mailings from our uh, suppliers. And also new products are publicized on newspapers and websites. So a lot of public announcements are quite legitimate. So when is it that they can become a breach? And the horizontal guidelines uh, has two specific cases in which this could be a breach. First of all, when there are an invitation to collude. I say publicly, for example, one example is, I will reduce my, I will increase my price if my competitors do the same. Or if there is a pattern of unilateral public announcements and strategic responses by competitors. I raise my price, and the same day, everybody else in the market does the same by the same amount. So 
these are the areas that the Commission or, or the, the CMA or any authority in Europe would be concerned. As you can see, two points to make. First of all, it is not easy to distinguish between legitimate and illegitimate con conduct. And there are also not that many cases which deals with price signaling. And the one, the first where this came up is 84, wood pulp. I'm not going to cover wood pulp in the interest of time, but as I say, I, I put the main, the main information of the case about there. Maybe the only thing to say is that what you had is producers announcing prices for the next quarter to trade press and sales agent, agents. They were not, they were not final. They still could change the prices. Uh, and, and also they were all, all suppliers, all producers became very quickly aware of those announcements. Interesting enough, DCJ cost decision. First of all, because public announcement of future pricing, in this case, did not infringe competition law because the players could not be sure that others would follow. But also, the Commission should have looked at whether there was a reasonable explanation for that, for that unilateral uh, announcement. For example, was it necessary, was there a legitimate purpose of giving customers relevant information in advance? You will see that is a key point in how to assess uh, price signaling. But we've seen recently uh, 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 more and more cases in this area, so it's becoming relevant again. I think the one I really like is the one that happened in Spain in 2013. You have the president of an association of hotels, but also the CEO of two hotels, which in public meetings, in trade fairs, conference, kept on saying that hotels in Spain were too cheap compared to other countries. They should increase prices by 6 7%. And all his, his announcements were widely reported in the specialized press and also national newspaper. And in one of the meetings, he even stupidly said, if there's somebody from the competition agents here, I'd be sanctioned. As you would expect, the CMC, the Spanish Company Authority, did sanction the trade association and the individual himself. For different reasons, the court annulled the case. But as you can see, that was deemed price signaling by the CMC. Similarly, in the Netherlands, you had a, a, a couple of events where CEO of mobile operators were participating. And there were several possible exchanges. But one which is really interesting is one where uh, you had two CEOs and, and a moderator in the middle. One of the two CEOs says, you know, well, there's a lot of, it's a difficult market. I think we'll need to increase our prices. And the moderator, in order to provoke some discussion, turn around to the other uh, CEO and say, okay, and if they do this, what would you do? And the CEO tried not to answer. But as you know, the moderator kept on trying until finally the other CEO said, well, of course, if they increase the prices, we will increase our prices as well. Again, uh, they were not fine, but certainly were chastised by the Dutch competition authorities. The, the other two cases are quickly deal is the 2014 cement, in the UK, it was an investigation by the Competition Commission, which no longer exists. Supplier sent every year a letter with planned price increases to their customer. They were only aspirational, rarely implemented, and prices were then negotiated. But future price information was also going to other suppliers. By virtue of high degree of that integration, suppliers were told to have specific commitments and therefore not being subject to and uh, being on, no longer aspirational. Similar in EU container shipping, they were they were putting out public uh, re, public uh, they were putting out uh, 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 planned price increases. Uh, again, they were asked to make that binding rather than subject to uh, uh, possible change once the other had responded. So, price signaling. What do you do to minimize risk? First of all, consider whether the announcement is necessary to minimize risks. Consider, uh, uh, then announce only the final decision, not future intention. Obviously, announce as late as possible and review the timing. And avoid naming the main competitor or make the announcement contingent on what competitors could do. Usually, it would be best not to do changes to price immediately after everybody else and to not communicate more information than necessary. 
That's all I want to say on price signaling. Let me quickly move to trade association. Uh, trade associations have a lot of legitimate sanctions, reasons to it. We, companies talk about technical issues, they respond together to changes in legislation, they represent industry, but they could lead to competitors sharing competitive sense information in a meeting or through information disseminated by trade association. And the two recent cases by the CMA where actually the trade association was fined for doing exactly that. So what to do in relation to trade association? First of all, before joining or attending the meeting, ask if there is a clear business need to be a member or even to attend the meeting. In one of my previous companies, we looked, for, for financial reasons, we started looking at trade association. We saw we were members of too many. And actually, we didn't need to be members of all of them, and we reduced substantially uh, the cost. Uh, and also, it obviously decreased the competition risks. Make sure that the association has a competition law compliance policy, and if you can, review the agendas, and be always wary of AOBs. During the meeting, discuss only non-competitive sense information, that's the guidance we give to our business, and if there are concerns about a particular discussion, request discussion to stop, and if not, leave immediately and request that minutes reflect departures. In the past, we used to advise everybody to throw a glass and make sure it's a minute. Now everybody knows that, so uh, now it's best that you leave the room and, and call the lawyer, the union house lawyer, quickly. And after the meeting, review meeting minutes. I think people are really concerned about the principle we discussed, a single meeting is enough, somebody saying on it, uh, uh, without the others participating will be enough. And I know a lot of companies have a complete blanket ban on attending trade association. I don't think it's necessary to go that way, that far, but certainly lots of precautions have to be put in place. Benchmarking. Benchmarking, again, it's a good thing because if you benchmark yourself against others, you will know where you should improve. So it's generally pro-competitive, but you have to have safeguard in place when you do it. First of all, if it contains anything which is remotely sensitive, a third party is necessary to collect information. And it must be include, it must include a little, more than usually five participants, so it's difficult to guess who answered what. Information that needs to be shared must only be historic and, and prices must not be shared. Document why there was a pro-competitive purpose and conduct as much as possible through written questions. If a meeting is really necessary, work for a written agenda so it doesn't go uh, further than what is necessary. The one thing I want to put your attention on is HR is very well known for doing salary benchmarks. They want to know if we are somebody, what are our competitors uh, 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 paying? And they do a lot of these exercises, knowing exactly which the competitors are. I think it's an area you should be careful as you pay attention because, as, as you know, even employment, for example, the no portion agreement, could be breaches of competition law. Very quickly, I'll skip very quickly vertical exchanges. This is a very specific UK matter. It happened in, in a couple of cases and the CAP clarified what it is. And basically, you can have a, a, have a spoke agreement, a vertical exchange, where distributor A wants to pass information to distributor B and they use the manufacturer to do that. And everybody knows why the information is being shared and distributor B uses that. So quite a high threshold. The one which is actually the most frequent is a case where a competitor it also, also has a, 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 a customer relationship with another competitor. And I can give an example of a bank. You might have a big bank and a small bank. The small bank wants a loan from the big bank. So they approach the big bank for that loan. If you apply as an individual for a loan, what do you give? You give your intended uh, income, where it's coming from, what your plans are for the future. So you give a lot of strategic information. But remember, those banks are competitors. So I think one can safely say that while the information has been shared for a legitimate purpose, with other information the big bank would not give a loan, that information might not be used for any other purpose and must not go outside the team which has vetted the, the loan to the small banks. 
And we see that in lots of different scenarios in different sectors. Merger and acquisition, I'll be very fast here because obviously there are various, set, various steps in a merger, but the principle which I'm sure you're aware of is that prior to closing, the merger parties remain separate entities. If they are competitors, the exchange of competitive sense information could be a breach of competition law. And, and actually, there's a couple of US cases where the DOJ fined a company because actually they pretended to acquire another company, a competitor, for the only reason they wanted to get access to the information they had. So what are the safeguards you put in place? I think you know all of that, so I'll be a brief. Uh, confidentiality agreement is the first thing. Exchange of information shared must be limited to what is necessary to assess, to do the due diligence. Uh, you create clean teams that deal with complacent information. If a business is involved, you quarantine him if the transaction does not go ahead. And if really some strategic information has to be shared, only a subset of people can look at it, or you have an independent party like a, a consultant or a lawyer that assess it and present it to the board, or you reinvent the deal team. But also, obviously, you destroy all documents you have if the transaction has not proceeded. The final substantive point of my discussion is about joint ventures between competitors. And uh, I know it's almost the last topic, but it's certainly one of the most complex I've had to deal with. And also because it is very joint venture specific. There's not a size that fits all. It will depend on the shareholders, on the agreements. Uh, and and, and, and uh, there are usually a tension when you have a joint venture with competitors because the shareholders, they, they won't frequently report about the activity of the joint venture. And the joint venture itself might be a competitor. Or you have a scenario where a senior, senior manager for you know, uh, the parent A is seconded to joint venture, which, are, which has information of apparent B. So you have a lot of possibility of exchanging information. And, and, and the most obvious are where the shareholder use the joint venture to share between themselves strategic information, similar to the hub and spoke agreement. Or the joint venture, most of the time, uh, unknowingly or, uh, shares with one shareholder strategic information of the other shareholder. And finally, the third example is when the joint venture competes with the shareholders and shares strategic information of the JV with the shareholders. So you can see a lot of different possible scenarios. But what I can say is there are a couple of principles that will apply to most of the most of those scenarios. The first and the most important one is that the information that is exchanged must relate to the business matter of the joint venture. So that, that information that is necessary for the collaboration and limited to the specific scope of the joint venture. So there must not be a spillover. But also, you need to put in place a protocol for exchanging competitive information. For example, you need to firewall some of the employees. Uh, for, if you have a joint, for example, you have a joint venture board member, which is seconded by one of the shoulders, and has access to information of the other shoulder, they should not share it with personnel of the other of their appointing shareholders. So they, they usually sign a declaration, say they would wear two hats, one as an employee of the shareholder, one as a, a board member, for example, of the JV. And training is extremely important because those people, remember, are business people, sometimes they really want guidance. I've heard in my career many times the business was eager to, to do the right thing and they wanted to know what they could and what they couldn't do. But as I say, it's not an easy topic. And finally, if somebody from a shareholder has been involved in the matter of the joint venture, if they go back to a similar role within the shareholder, for example, they are a managing director or price or market head of marketing, they should not have similar responsibilities within the shareholder for a certain period of time. That brings me to the last point, which, as I said, I, uh, I will deal very, very quickly. Uh, there's been a quick run through a lot of issues uh, so I want to deal with this easily. You're all familiar that COVID-19 has prompted a, 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 a range of measures which we have not seen before. 
And we've had relaxation of competition law in lots of different sectors, allowing certain types of cooperation. And you've had that by law, you've had guidance of a competition authority, you've had, and, and you know which sectors are being affected. And the principles that both the law and the guidance says are all the same. There must be a pro-competitive purpose, it must be limited in scope, it must be reasonably necessary, limited in time, and you need to document all that you're doing. But all the authorities are very clear on one thing, exchanging information on cost or prices. So some of the things I've already said, it is still illegal. So it doesn't mean that authorities are giving carte blanche to all the competitors to do what they want. There are still limits. And clearly, if it was complicated to assess before, it's even more complicated to assess now that things are or are not legal or illegal. I think that brings me to the end of my presentation. I know it's been quite a, a wide range of issues, but I, I thought I'd give you a few tips on how to deal with different scenarios and different categories of information exchanges. It is certainly a very evolving topic, and one, as I say, I've been finding quite fascinating for a lot of time. I'm sure we'll see more and more I'm sure once the COVID-19 crisis is over, we'll see a lot of activity by competition authority in the area of information exchanges that will go back to what has happened. So clearly, it's a space that we will all have to look at. And obviously, as you can imagine, happy to help, happy to answer any question you might have uh, at the end of this presentation. I got to find, which I think refers to the RBS Barclays. And the question is, how much was the fine? Uh, the exchange was for six months. And if I do remember correctly, uh, and I apologize if I'm mistaken, it was 27 million pounds fine on RBS. Another question is what should in practice a company do if it receives passively and unwittingly sensitive information about a competitor from the competitor itself or from a third parties, e.g. a potential customer or an intermediary? The only defense, as I said earlier on, is distancing yourself. So for example, as I said earlier on, if it's in an email, just uh, immediately send an email back saying you will not use it. If it is in a meeting, make sure that it's minuted that you oppose that discussion happening and make sure that uh, uh, it is in the minutes, so everybody knows exactly the time in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, distancing from the exchange of information. Another question is, for information exchange, there is no need for ballad exchanges. One-way communication is enough. Does it apply equally to instant communications at Bloomberg IM? I think I've already answered this one because if you remember when I was speaking about HSBC, uh, this is, sorry, HSBC, it was in the IM, it was, it was an exchange, but in any case, uh, even if it was unilateral, it would be caught. Uh, the Eturas case, uh, you had a, a, an email unilaterally from the platform. That was enough. So it doesn't matter the way it's communicated, IM, uh, uh, Zoom, or whatever, it will still be an infringement. And I think I've, I've dealt with all the questions I had so far, and uh, I've been, I'm in time, I'm in time with, uh, uh, just to finish this, uh, a, 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 spot, a spot on, on, uh, on one hour, which I thought was a challenge. I know, as I say, that Leon has been around for a lot of issues, but the slides will be available on my page, so you can go back and look at them. Uh, and I say, if you want to listen to it again or just one section, uh, feel free. And at the same time, please feel free to send me. I've seen already just one or two more questions. Uh, in the interest of time, I will reply to you separately. So, uh, and if you have any other questions, please feel free to drop me a line. I think it's been a great pleasure and I really have to, uh, it's been a pleasure to present for one hour. You've listened patiently. 
So, uh, and I'm sure, and as I know, as you know, we all know, we all submitted to a lot of webinars. So, thank you again. And uh, as I said, I'll reply to some of the last questions individually. <laughs> thank you very much.